I am going to be uh, uh, beginning really kind of a topical series just for three weeks. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, the Bible says, And now abides faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. So all three of these are the building blocks of just basic Christianity. They're just the normal things, and we need to look at these. So we're going to talk about faith today. Next Sunday we'll talk about hope. That's the forgotten word of the three. And then we'll talk about love. Uh, and just kind of to remind ourselves why the Lord thinks these three are so important. Now, um, I apologize to Kale before we got started because I think I'm going to use about 12 different scriptures. But I'm only going to use a verse or two at a time. It, when you do a topical message, just like on a subject, usually you don't go to one place just to get everything from it. The word faith is used two times in the Old Testament. One of those two times was quoted three times in the New Testament. But it was used 227 times in the New Testament. Twice in the Old Testament, it talked about faith. Now, it talked a lot about the law in the Old Testament, right? This is what you're supposed to do. Y'all got that? How many of y'all know what you're supposed to do? I should have said, how many of you do what you're supposed to do? It's not a matter of if we know it. I always said to everybody, my problem is not knowing the Word of God. My problem is doing everything that I already know that I'm supposed to do. By the way, Shirley McDonald, happy birthday. I'm never up doing announcements, so I looked down there and it said, Shirley McDonald's got a birthday today. 39. Bless your heart. Amen. I would sing happy birthday to you, but I don't want everybody to run out of the building at the same time. So, The, the Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. That's the verse that's quoted in Romans to the Roman people, Romans 1.17. To the other Gentile people, the providence of Galatia in Galatians 3.11. And then even to the Hebrew people in Hebrews 10 verse 36. The just shall live by his faith. Faith is supposed to be just an absolute overflow of our life. It's just supposed to be the normal thing that we do. But when Jesus walked on earth, he would sometimes be around a group of people and he'd say, Oh, ye of little faith. And then he would look at this group of people and he'd say, great faith. Now, the thing is, is that two of the times, he only said great faith four times, but two of the times were not even to Jewish people. One was in Romans, uh, excuse me, Matthew 8 to a, a Roman centurion. One was to a, a, a Gentile lady who uh, had been sick. Now, when he said Great faith or little faith, really what he was doing was he was trying to tell us that we needed to evaluate our faith. Jesus said so much about faith, and if we need to evaluate it, I want us to kind of just think, what is faith? Now, um, probably one of the greatest people that I have, well, I don't want to say met, known and heard and followed was a preacher by the name of Manly Beasley. Um, he was a great, he was known as a great man of faith. He had gotten a promise from God when he was a young preacher that he would see his grandchildren. Now, y'all say, how did he get that? Well, do y'all know when God speaks? You know it in your heart? I have heard God many times. I've never heard him with an audible voice, but God has told me many things. And he knew that God had given him that promise. It was a promise in the Word of God. And he made it his own. After that, he got sick to where the doctors gave up on him and said, you're done. And yet he lived. He got sick again with a different illness. And the doctor said, you're done. And he said, I'm going to live. And he lived. The third time, 
he got sick with a different illness. And the doctor said, you're done. As a matter of fact, the doctor walked out of the hospital room and saw his, wife, his Manley's wife walking down the hall and gave her the news, I'm sorry, Manley's gone. She said, no, he's not. And, you know, he, I guess doctors get used to this. They're like, oh, you know, yes, I was in there. We've, we've pronounced him. He's dead. And she said, no, he's not. So then he's going to comfort the wife and walk in with Marthy into the room. And when they walk into the room, he's sitting up in bed, pushing the little button because he wants something to eat. It almost gets hilarious, right? Now, this was Manley's definition. You've heard me. I said this to you a couple years ago. I just want to remind you of it. This is Manley's definition of what real faith was. He said, I began to realize that God was waiting on me. He said God was waiting on Manley to act on his revealed truth because faith is acting on the Word of God. I must not only believe he can meet a need, I must begin to act as though the need has already been met, even though I might not be able to see it, feel it, smell it, taste it, or hear it. I'm a, I must begin acting as if it is so when it is not so in order for it to be so because with God it already is so. Manly was a kind of a guy that when God spoke to him, he just said, okay. One time he went to a meeting to preach a revival meeting and, and the Lord told him, not to take any money with him, not to take a credit card, not to take any money, and to go to the meeting. So he gets to the meeting, and he said, Lord, I'm here, and I'd really like, I forgot my razor, I'd really like to be able to shave. I mean, you don't want stubble, I guess, all week. And he said, I know that's a selfish thing to pray for, but could I have a shaving kit? Just to fast forward, i got to get on to preaching here, but he said at the end of the service, this lady came up to him and she said, I know you're going to think I'm foolish, but, but God told me, I bought a shaving kit today, and God told me to go get it in my vehicle and give it to you. Now, when you get certain things like that, when you live a life of faith, you cease to be surprised by all the things God is telling you to do. Now, I am absolutely okay that you may be skeptical in this moment. Not a word. But I just want you to know, when God evaluates us, is he going to evaluate us and say great faith, great trust in him? Look, or little faith. It's up to us. Truly, if you're going to pray about something, but you're living with an expectation that that prayer is going to happen, but you don't act upon it, is that really faith? In Mark chapter 2, verse number 5, four people brought a person who could not walk on a mat, on a, a, a kind of a, a, a cart, a, a kind of like the, they would get the backboard, you know, and, and carry them in. And they couldn't get in the house. Y'all know the story? So they walked up on the roof, the stairs that went up on the roof, and they did something that, in my personal opinion, if they did this without hearing from God, they should be arrested. They started to tear the roof off. Can you just imagine stomping, pulling, everything else to make room to get this person that's being carried on this mat into the house? Could you imagine being in the house and all of a sudden the ceiling starts to fall and a foot goes through? and they're ripping this person's house apart. But then they lower the person down in the room. Now here's the thing that you need to hit. Y'all like it when Jesus speaks? Jesus said when Jesus saw their faith, not the faith of the man who needed to be healed, when Jesus saw the faith of the four people who brought him and to the lengths that they went through, went to, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. 
And then he healed him. And by the way, they, they wouldn't part so they could get him in the room, but when he was walking out carrying his mat, they got out of his way and he walked out. Had it not been for four people loving, believing, trusting, and acting upon it, would the man have been healed? In Ephesians chapter 2, that great verse on what we call salvation, Ephesians 2 says, For by grace have you been saved through... Say it. It's God's grace. We don't deserve it. And God wants to do it for us. But He says you're saved through faith. It's not of yourself. You didn't do it. It's the gift of God freely given. Not of works. Now hold on. Lest anyone should boast. It's not what you do. Not of works. But literally what he is going to say is this. As you believe, act on your faith. And God's grace is released in salvation. Let me see if I can explain this. When I got saved, I've been in the church my whole life. My dad preached. I was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I was there Monday night for RAs. I was, I was in church. I knew the stories. Now, hold on. Y'all looking? I believed in God. I believed Jesus was God's son. I believed with all my heart that he went to die on the cross of saving me from my sins. I believed that he shed his blood. I believe that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I was as lost as lost could be. And the wooing of God began to draw me to himself. And there was something I needed to do. I needed not only to believe in God, I needed to repent of my sin. And I needed to give my heart and life to God. I, I needed to not just say what I believed, I needed to become a follower. That meant I was going to do what he's told me to do. I struggled with this. For months, I struggled with it. I don't know why, but I did. I knew what I needed to do. And there was tension that was there. But when I acted on it, y'all have heard me tell this story. On a Sunday night, second pew, I pushed my mom out of the way. I walked down. I walked past my dad. It wasn't between me and my dad. He was the preacher. I went to the, the, the altar, and I got on my knees, and I gave my heart and life to Christ as best a 10-year-old can. And I said I would become a follower of Christ. And as a 10-year-old, I, I became a follower of Christ the best that I knew how. Other things happened in my life. There were other milestones but I was crying. I felt like I was going to explode when I left and went down there. But I met Christ there and I woke up, or not woke up, I didn't go to sleep. I got up different. Because that time I didn't struggle. That time I gave my heart. I acted on it. Too many people say that, that I, I believe. Do you really? Do you really? Are you, are you willing to Act on something, or are you waiting for God to make it make sense to you before you act upon it? Brother Manley said, you have to hear a word from God, and once that word of God is revealed, then you have to act upon it. Though you don't see it, taste it, smell it, touch it, the just shall live by his faith. Two blind men were following Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus just walked on in the house. Almost like he was ignoring them. They came in the house. Jesus looked at him and said, what would you like for me to do? Well, obviously, they knew what they needed to do. Matthew chapter 9, verse 28 says this. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. Hold on. Two blind people chasing after this man, following him into a house. 
He said, do you believe? Yes, Lord. He touched their eyes saying, are you ready for this? Verse 29. According to your faith, let it be to you. It's almost like God saying, I, I want to bless you. And as you turn loose, and as your faith is instigated, I'll do it. According to your faith. Now, let me ask it again. If they had not had faith, would God have touched their eyes and healed them of blindness? According to your faith, it meant they were going to have to do it too. But because they believed, God answered. Faith is the activation point. The power in the work of it resides totally in God. It's not what we do to perform the action. It's how we believe and how we trust God. Let me give you another one. Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Don't have faith in you. Please hear this. Don't have faith in your faith. The object of your faith must be God. How many of you believe God can do anything? Well, literally, he is saying, as you act upon that, he says, have faith that God, not you, for as surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. God is the object of our faith. Can I just be honest? It's easy to understand how many people can be confused here. There are a lot of people that are going around, and, and we, call it, we call them the name it and claim it. They just say, I, I, I just speak it and it comes to life. You're not a magician. You don't have that. God's the only one that can do that. But what we're saying is, is when God says it, are you willing to trust it? To the point, oh, church, please hear. To the point where you're, so, you're willing to say, I believe and act on it. When I heard this illustration when I was a kid. If, if, if a kid is on a dock and he can't swim, and the dad is down in the water, and the dad says to him, jump. Now the kid looks at the water and says, I can't swim, and you're asking me to do something I can't do. And you've been telling me how I can drown. Matter of fact, you've been scaring me, and I wish you hadn't have done that. But the father's down there saying, it's okay, I love you, I'll take care of you. That doesn't make it any easier on the kid. You don't learn to swim by watching someone else. You don't learn to swim simply by trusting that, that, that God can give you the ability to swim. If you, the only way you're going to learn to swim is what? Jump. And if you don't act upon it, you're going to stay up there dry, aren't you? God is like saying, look, I'm here for you. Life is tough. This is a hard world. But the Son of God came to be the intermediary between us and God. It's like Jesus is going to grab hold of God and grab hold of us and be the link. But we have to reach out and grab His hand. We have to do this. So if you believe, you're going to act on it. That's called faith. I know my power can't do it. And trust me, I know that God doesn't work against himself. Just because you say it does not mean that it's going to happen. But if God says it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I know this is dated, but please hear this. All that's going on in the Middle East right now, around Israel, 
God's already said he's going to take care of Israel. He's already said that. That's not up for debate. Matter of fact, he made it plain in Scripture. He brought them back together in 1948. They had been scattered since A.D. 70. He brought them back together. He gave them that place. It doesn't matter that the people who were there before do not want a Jewish state. They've always been enemies of the Jewish people. It does not matter if Hamas is going to start throwing rockets. I'm here to tell you, when you fight against Israel, you're fighting against God. The wise thing to do would be to listen, obey, and get on the right side. In your personal life, how many of us are going to be obedient to what we already know is true? Luke 18, verse 18 says this. When the Son of Man comes, will He really find faith on the earth? Hold on. I spent three weeks talking about when Christ comes back. Amen? He can do it whenever he so chooses to. The trumpet's going to blow. He's coming back. How much in your life right now is being lived by faith? What are you doing in your life that if God doesn't come through, you're sunk? What are you trusting God for? That's beyond your capabilities. Are you living your life simply by getting up every day, doing what you think is a good, right thing to do? People say, I do my best. I'm not perfect, but I do my best. Okay, we're, we're good with that. God knows us. But how many things are you doing in your day that you're trusting God for? And if He doesn't come through, you're not going to make it. Jesus was talking to his disciples about forgiveness. Lord, how, how many times should I forgive? Do you, does anybody in here have a trouble with forgiveness? I mean, people are rude. People are mean. Hard times. I'm not saying that after he twists your arm, you forgive. I mean, is it the natural flow of your life? How many times should I forgive this person? It's been time after time after time. I'm frustrated. How many times? Till seven times? What did Jesus say? Until 70 times seven. What was their response at that point? This was their response. Luke 17, verse 5. So the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. If you're going to ask me to do this, I need more faith. I hadn't got it yet. You don't understand. They hurt me. They hurt the one I love. They don't deserve my forgiveness, but i got to forgive them anyway. I've got to release the debt. I've got to act as if it never happened. I can't even say anything about it. I need more faith. You know what I found out when people pray the prayer that the apostles said, increase our faith? God will say, okay, I'll increase your faith. Let me increase the heat in your circumstances. We don't act on God until we have to. We don't do the hard things until we've tried everything else and nothing works. He said, they said, increase our faith. So our faith needs to grow. So the Lord said, verse 6, Luke 17, verse 6, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a, uh-oh, y'all heard this, the mustard seed, the smallest of the small, it doesn't matter where you are now. God can activate it. You take the little bit of faith that you have, put it in the capable hands of Almighty God, and he says you can say to the mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots, be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. The power is of God, but our faith releases the power of God. 
Our faith is the key thing that he's looking for. From the very beginning of creation, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the seraphim. He created the cherubim. He created the archangels. He created the angels. And, and they were in a perfect state. They could be in his presence of the almighty God. But some of them said, no, I, I, I want to do it my own way. So you know what? He let them go. You want to do it your own way? Go right ahead. Two-thirds stay behind and follow God. And they will be blessed forever because of it. The other third of the angels will go to a place that's called hell. And the Bible says this about that. A place prepared for the devil and his angels. If you don't want the presence of God, you don't have to have it. But you'll be separated from the presence of God. All the things that they describe as hell, I can tell you a hundred more. Anywhere that you go without the love of God is a terrible place. Without comfort, without joy, without peace. I don't want to go there. I wouldn't want anyone to go there. But it was prepared for those people. So then he created man. By the way, knowing before he created us that we mess up. Because it says before the foundation, before the foundation of this world, before the foundation of the world, Christ knew he was going to have to come and go to the cross of Calvary. And yet he was willing. So that, look, the divide between a holy God and a sinful man, Jesus bridged the gap because he wants us to have a relationship with him. And it's a grace gift, for by grace are you saved but you've got to reach out to the one who will do it. Not one person who has faith in God, who gives their heart and life to God, who asked God to save them, who said that I am yours, I will follow you, not one person is turned away. But if you don't want it, What happens when we mess up? Anybody in here messed up? Oh, Jesus told the disciples that he was gonna, they were going to go to Jerusalem and he would be taken by soldiers and he would be crucified. Y'all remember that story? And old Pete, old Simon Peter, takes Jesus aside and says, Lord, I know you like that story. You've told us a few times that, but... I'm telling you, the rock here is for you. Old Pete's going to stand there by you. I'm not going to let this happen. This is not going to have to happen. You know, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Right? Luke 22, verse 32. I want you to hear the, the next part of this that I think is very important. Jesus said to Peter, he said, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen the brethren. Jesus knew that he was going to fail. But he's praying. Anybody ever had a little shortage of faith? Anybody handled the circumstance best you could, but it got tough? If I took a poll in here right now, how many of you believe God can? This is where it gets hard. How many of you believe God can even in you? How many of you believe God will? Then act on it. Act on it. That's all we're asking. Faith's not this great, big, mystic, mysterious thing. It's just not seeing it, but knowing it to the point that you're willing to do it, something about it. I'm going to read this again. Manly said, I begin to realize that God was waiting on me to act on his revealed truth because faith is acting on the word of God. I must not only believe he can meet a need. I must not only want him to meet a need. I must begin to act as though the need has been met even though I might not be able to see it, feel it, smell it, taste it, or hear it. I must begin acting as if it is so, 
when it is not so, in order for it to be so, because with God, it already is so. Right now, by the precious hand of the Holy Spirit of God, you're being challenged in your faith. Are you willing to believe no matter what? Or are you just willing to kind of go by your circumstances? It's warm in here. It's cold out there. So we wanted it, y'all to be warm in here. Y'all should have said amen to that, right? And when it gets warm in here and you get still, what happens? But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit just wants to speak to us today. You can trust him. I know you say you believe him. You can trust him. And you know what he's wanting to do? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? I'm not asking you to trust me, I'm asking you to trust him. I'm not asking you to depend on me. Depend on him. I'll let you down. He won't. You need to know that. If you'll make up your mind that you'll activate what you already say that you believe, that's going to get God up on his attention. He's going to say, all right, I like this now. I, I've been reaching out my hand for so long, but that now, now they're going to reach out there and grab it back. Maybe we just need to learn to swim in faith. 